A beautiful belly dancer receives a fax. Live not on evil, madame, it says. Live not on evil. The next day, she's found on the floor of this very nightclub, a bullet through her heart. Now, who would possess the motive for such a cruel act? The beautiful dancer's protege, now her rival. It's possible, of course. The victim's father, whose political fortunes would be destroyed if his daughter made good on her threats to reveal his past. Equally possible. But there is something about the message in this fax which vexes the mind of Hercule Poirot. Live not on evil, madame. Live not on evil. What is it about this sentence that is so interesting? I'll tell you. It is spelled the same backwards as forwards. We have here, my friends, what is known as a palindrome. Now, who would know of such a thing, this palindrome? Who would delight in such a thing? None other than the murdered woman's spurned lover. None other than the man she threatened to expose to the police as the arms dealer he is. None other than the world-renowned linguistic scholar, Dr. Torgut Basser. <laughs> Thank you. My dear Vera, you are most welcome. But you must try and keep better company. Oh, I couldn't possibly, Erkut. That would be boring. It's a long way from London to Istanbul. If you insist on filling your nightclub with persons such as these, you can't expect me to fly down to solve every crime that takes place. No, of course not. Not all of them. Just the interesting ones. <laughs> will you come to hear me sing tonight? Of course. And afterward, we will be together. Should we marry, Hercule? Marry? Why not? We've always been fascinating to each other. The world-famous detective and the never-quite-reformed jewel thief. Think how much fun you'll have trying to catch me. You're serious? Of course I am. And you'll love Istanbul. The palaces, the mosque, the exquisite Istanbul, ceramics. you propose I move to Istanbul? Well, I can't leave. My business is Your here. Your business? This is not a business. It's a den of thieves. And you can help me to clean it up. You're asking Hercule Poirot to be your... your security guard? That would be a fatal error in judgment, my dear. You're arrogant. I only met... The American press said I was the greatest crime solver. You're right, Hercule. You're right. It would be a disaster for such a rare being as yourself to live such a common life. I'm sorry to suggest it. Oh, oh. 
Wolfgang Buch, mon ami. You were in Istanbul and didn't tell your old friend. Shame on you. You must have come on a case. You've solved it, no doubt. Of course, and tomorrow I must fly back to London. Fly? What are you talking about? You happen to be talking to the director of the Orient Express. I'm going to London tomorrow myself, so you can travel with me by train. That's a very kind offer. It's not an offer, it's a demand. I must confess I'm not fond of air travel these days. Stale air, vile food. I'd much prefer a civilized trip on the world's most luxurious train. Moment, it's barbaric Mr. to travel Ratchet. any other way. There's a call for you. Yeah, what? You were about to be a very dead man, Ratchet. What? Just thought you'd like to know. Who is this? You threatening me? It's him again. I don't want any more calls. You understand me? No more calls! Do you know that man? No. I've had enough of this. Better know his type. Rich, obnoxious, belligerent. Glad you made it. <laughs> oh, this is truly a splendid train. The Orient Express, as you know, was created by my fellow Belgian. Of course, Monsieur Nagelmatt. <laughs> oh, this is the age I belong to, my friend. A vanished age of elegance and refinement. No one in a hurry. I've secured you a first-class compartment. It was reserved in the name of uh, Mr. Harris, but he cancelled the last moment. Here's your compartment, monsieur. See? All the comforts. Oh, it's excellent. Thank you. It was a disgrace, more than a disgrace, a tragedy. The Orient Express, the most magnificent train the world had ever seen, completely forgot. Its cars lying in scrap heaps all over Europe, rotting and rusting like old washing machines. But now, the Orient Express is resurrected. Young man, I cannot eat this salad. Madam? They are pine nuts on it. I am allergic to nuts of every kind. Take it away. Please, take it away. She's the widow of Generalissimo Alvarado, South American dictator. For who? Oh, uh, forgive me. My mind was temporarily elsewhere. It's a woman, isn't it? Uh, regrettably, yes. We are such opposites, Vera and I. She's flamboyant and beautiful. I'm reserved and homely. She's a thief. I'm a detective. <laughs> The only thing we have in common is our refusal to let the other rule our life, but I can't stop her ruling my thoughts. I must confess, I never expected to see the great Hercule Poirot suffering such a common malady as love. Ah, oh, look at this. Mary, look at the muscles. Crap. Gina, thank you. My pleasure, madam. Strange they're not sitting together. Who? The young woman and the American road warrior back there. I overheard them talking in the market. They seem very intimate. The mind of Peru never rests. But, my friend, there is no crime. Oh, never think that. But, for the moment, the mind of Hercule Poirot turns to dinner. Hello there. Uh, Excuse me, I must have 
must attend to this crisis. Please, don't wait on me to order. You see? Shall I call a doctor? I'm so sorry. La linea si ne sta andando. Oh, ancora lei? I spoke to the doctor. He has no idea as to how this goes. No, no. It's quite an adventure, isn't it? The Orient Express? If my daughter were here, this is the kind of thing she would just love. Pronto. Pronto. Oh, this phone never gets sick. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Business to find out. Yes, sir. Uh, to start, I'll have the burner. I don't want and stuff then... being sent to me for no reason. Hey. Uh, in the problem. Sir? Got a stick of water. Mr. Perrault. Perrault? Like the American presidential candidate? Certainly not. The name is Poirot. Hercule Poirot. Sam Ratchet. Mind if I sit down? Please. I, I recognized you from that TV show. What'd they call you? Uh, don't tell me. Uh, super Detective. Sleuth Supreme. Oh, yeah. Sleuth Supreme. And what do you do, Mr. Ratchet? I do whatever pleases me. Actually, I'm in uh, antiquities. Uh, what sort of antiquities? Mm -hmm. Ancient urns, fresco statues. You are a connoisseur of classical art. No, I am a connoisseur of money. I really like the old stuff, though. It holds its value, and um, they ain't making any more of it. You know what I mean? Listen, Hercules. I want to hire you. Oh, I'm afraid I have a very limited clientele. All right. All right. I can understand that. I'm like that myself. You gotta be selective. There's a lot of money in it. A lot. What would you want me to do for you? Somebody has threatened my life. Who would do such a thing? <laughs> if I knew that, I'd have taken care of it myself. But unlike you, I am not a sleuth supreme. So what I want you to do is find the bad guys for me, and I'll take it from there. I'm afraid I cannot oblige you. All right. Two hundred thousand dollars, tax-free. Thank you, Mr. Ratchet, but I have made up my mind. That's a lot of money to turn down. I've been very fortunate in my career, Mr. Ratchet, as you have in yours. I've managed to pay for my needs as well as my caprices, and now I only take on cases that appeal to me. Really? And um, what's wrong with this one? May I speak personally? Sure. I find you intolerable.
French frog when I came here. I think he's Belgian. What? Barbara, it's not the French, it's the Belgian. Good evening. Good evening. It's a strange dark night, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Now, relax your neck. What do you mean? Like, like this? Yes. Much better. Hey, come in. Come in. Join us. My new friend Bob and I are uh, having a tension reduction workshop. Really? See. Thanks. You Americans never give yourself credit for all the things you have that are new. Mm -hmm. Now, if you would only... Excuse me. Yeah. But I'm in the next door compartment, and your conversation's going to make it difficult for me to sleep. Sorry about that. Please, come in. Please. Have a drink. Join us. Thank you. Vera, you would look ravishing in this. But then you look ravishing in anything. Très bien, monsieur. Très bien, monsieur. Just I, I know what I'm dreaming and what I'm not. I saw someone, so you gotta do something about Very it. Very good, madame. I'll search the train immediately. You rang your bell, Monsieur Poirot? Yes, um, the train has stopped. There is no station here. Regrettably, a rock slide has obstructed the tracks, monsieur. It is a hazard of this country. I'm sure we'll be on the way as soon as possible. Excuse me, Monsieur Poirot. Have you seen anyone suspicious tonight? No. Why? The American woman, Mrs. Hubbard, she insists there was a man hiding in her compartment. A man? What did he look like? I do not know. She did not get a good look. It was dark. As soon as she spotted him, he flew out the door. Myself. I think she was dreaming. I think she likes the idea of a man hiding in her compartment. Hello. My name is Mr. Bogdan. 
Mr. Ratchet. Morning. Mr. Ratchet. Uh, they're gonna stop serving breakfast in another half hour. We're stranded in the middle of nowhere because of a landslide. Oh, I guess I can't sit here. I am expected in Milan on Tuesday. And I can't even get a signal on my phone. Plus, there was a man in my room last night and nobody Please, seems everybody to calm down. Mrs. Mrs. Hubbard, you know, Alvarado, Mr. Foscarelli. We have the person of the river checks. It will just take time. Oh, you You don't seem terribly upset about a little crisis, Mr. Poirot, isn't it? Assuredly. And you are? Mary Debenham. Uh, Miss Debenham. I am never in a hurry, and when the world slows down to my pace, I find it very agreeable. Monsieur Book! Monsieur Book. What is it, Pierre? You'd better come. At once. Will you excuse me, Miss Debenham? I have a fatal curiosity. <laughs> What's happened, Book? Something disagreeable. Yes. Very disagreeable indeed. Keep the passengers occupied in the dining car. Don't allow anyone near this compartment. Very good, monsieur. The window is open. It's unusual. No doubt. That's how the killer made his escape. Who's that? Appears to be a stylus. It's used for entering data into handheld computers. This man has been stabbed many times. Who would do such a thing? I don't know. Well, uh, you have to find out. No, oh, no, I have no authority here, Book. Oh, we must get to Belgrade and then the police. We'll be delighted to discover that the crime has already been solved. Besides, the longer we wait, the farther the killer will have gotten. I doubt the killer has gone far. You think he's still on the train? But the window? There is loose soil outside the window. A fleeing man would have left footprints, but there are none. Um, now, this window has been left open merely to confuse us. I urge you to help me out of this, for the sake of the passengers. Very well, I accept the case. Five, six, seven, eight, nine wounds in all. It's curious. Some are so slight as to be mere scratches, but on the other hand, at least three could be capable of causing death. It's as if he were killed by two people, one strong, one feeble. A woman was involved then? We shouldn't assume that the feeble blows were inflicted by a woman. A strong woman in a, in a grip of emotion makes an excellent assailant. Well, we can't complain that there are no clues in this case. He seems unusually peaceful for a man who's met such violence, don't you think? A man of Mr. Ratchet's ferocious nature would have fought back. We would have seen it in the contortions of his body. Here is his pistol. Fully loaded. But he never fired it. Odd. Perhaps he was struck. You may be right. How else to explain this unnatural repose? Uh, it seems only his watch put up a fight. Look, the hands are stopped at a quarter past one. The moment of the crime. Another very interesting clue. Book. I would like to retrieve something from the trash, a, a videotape. Of course.
Mr. McQueen, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I just, uh, it's just a little freaked out, you know? I've never seen anything like that before. It's... Yes, it must be a shock. You are under no obligation to answer any of my questions. Perhaps it doesn't matter to you who killed Mr. Ratchet. No, no. I'd be interested to know finally got to it. Finally? Did he have enemies? Well, he seemed to. You're getting these threatening phone calls. Threatening? In what way? Well, as in, you're gonna die, Ratchet, or your time's up, Ratchet. It was stuff like that. It was a man's voice. Uh, they all came to the hotel in Istanbul in the last week or so. In fact, the last one came just the other night. Yesterday, I saw Mr. Ratchet smash up a videotape. What was on it? I don't know. Someone left it for him at the door of his room. Uh, I guess he watched about five minutes of it, and it went ballistic. It went ballistic a lot. I'm sorry he's dead, but, you know, if I were to be honest, I'd have to say he was a total bastard. <sighs> Looks like I just made myself a suspect, right? Mm -hmm. uh. Uh, what did you do for Mr. Russell? Uh, well, I guess he hired me as a kind of consultant. I got a degree in ancient Mesopotamian art from uh, Yale. That was good for his image, you know. Ivy League assistant, smooth things over, interpret for him. Oh, Ratchet wasn't the sort of guy who could be bothered to learn a single word in another language, so... I thought he was a legitimate dealer at first, but then I started putting two and two together, and I realized that he was in the business of looting archaeological sites. I tried to get away from him, but... It's not easy getting away from a guy like Ratchet. Do you own a handheld computer, Mr. McQueen? Me? Uh, no, no. <laughs> not old-fashioned like that. Uh, I like pen and paper. Oh, just one more question. When was the last time you saw Mr. Ratchet alive? I guess it was around 10. Uh, we had some work to do. Went to go get him his pill. His and... pill? Yeah, uh, melatonin. Uh, he was always flying from one time zone to another. He thought it helped him from getting jet lag, so... Anyway, uh, I got him his pill, and... It was the last I saw of him. He rang his bell about 20 minutes to 1. I knocked on his door, but he called out to say he had made a mistake. In French? Yes, monsieur, in French. Where were you, Pierre, at uh, quarter past one? Uh, quarter past one, I believe I was sitting in my little seat at the end of the corridor. But it was about this time that the train came to a stop, and I recall getting up from my station to go outside to see what the trouble was. Other than that, you were in the corridor all night? Well, except for perhaps 45 minutes later when uh, Monsieur Book called me to discuss what to tell the passengers about the stoppage. This is true. Did you see anyone in the corridor in the early hours of the morning? Well, there was a kind of a party going on in Monsieur Foscarelli's room until quite late. Uh, the young English lady was there and the two American gentlemen. It ended about 2.30, I think. And where did they go? to their own compartments. I, I didn't see anyone else in the corridor after that. Thank you, Pierre. That'll be all for now. May I get you something? No, thank you. Well, my friend, in our quest for the truth, we will test the limits of technology. At seven years old, the only daughter of software tycoon Steve Armstrong Little Daisy was a vivacious and enchanting child. That made the tragic death all the more unbelievable. You guys are just like the airline. Never tell anybody what's going on. There was a murder here last night. Everyone on board knows it. But do you guys admit it? No. It's like your lawyer said you can't even make a passing Mrs. reference Harbert, to it. please calm yourself. Would you please not speak to me in that condescending French manner? Well, I'm not French, madame. I'm Belgian. My name is Hercule Poirot. Yes, I know who you are. And don't think just because you're a celebrity, because you've been on television, don't think I'm intimidated by you. I'm a celebrity myself, you know. Indeed. Phil and Phyllis, the sitcom. I played Carlotta, the aerobics instructor. I wasn't in every show, but I was a recurring character. Uh, Mrs. Hubbard, may I ask you why you're traveling on the Orient Express? Well, I'd come to Turkey to do a mini-series. Uh, 
Samson and Delilah. But you know how these things go. The director got kidney stones, and then he was replaced by some hack who decides that the evil high priestess should instead be the evil high priest. Oh, and who did they decide to play the new evil high priest? The producer's boyfriend, no less. You know, never mind that he's never set foot in front of a camera before. So who gets off the plane to find that a part's been cut? Anyway, I thought I'd go home on the Orient Express. I thought at least travel like a movie star. Do you think the man in the compartment was the murderer? Oh, this man in your compartment, what did he look like? I don't know. I mean, I was so scared, I just lay in my bed with my eyes squeezed shut. I could hear him moving around, though. Your compartment adjoins that of Mr. Ratchet's. Do you think that's where he came from? Obviously. I think he, he killed him, and then he escaped through the connecting door into my compartment. The door wasn't locked? I thought it was. That was before I learned my lesson about the security on this train. The conductor found no intruder in your compartment when you called. How do you suppose he got out? I'm not a world-famous detective, Mr. Perot. I'll leave that to you. Is that all? Oh, yes, madame. OK. Oh, by the way, I'll be expecting a refund for everything I've gone through. And I mean a whole refund, you know, not one of those $5 vouchers that the airline gives you. That'll hardly get you a frozen yogurt. Oh, madame, you dropped your handkerchief. It's not my handkerchief. Well, it has a letter H embroidered on it. Your name is Hubbard, I naturally assumed. It's 2001, Mr. Poro. Who carries around embroidered handkerchiefs anymore? <laughs> oh, I almost forgot. I have a piece of evidence for you. I found this in my room. I assure you it was not there when I went to sleep last night. Do you think this is the button the killer left behind? It's possible. But it's from the jacket of an Orient Express conductor. See? I have lost no button. None of my buttons are missing. Neither are the buttons of the other conductors. But you were the only one who was in Mrs. Hubbard's compartment last night. Are you accusing me of this crime? I am innocent, absolutely innocent. Do not imagine that I killed this man. Why would I kill a man I'd never even seen before? Please, monsieur. Console yourself, Pierre. No one is accusing you. Now, please, go back to the coach and ask Mr. Arbuthnot if he would be so kind as to meet me in the bar. Very good, monsieur. Pierre's a good man, but nervous. This job is all he has. No family? His wife died some years ago. He had a daughter, but she is dead as well. Suicide, they say. How unfortunate. Why did I take the Orient Express? It's the most famous train in the world. I can afford it, so why shouldn't I? You are in Istanbul. May I ask why? You may. Don't know why I should answer. I mean, what's the controlling legal authority here exactly? No, well, there is none. Until we reach Belgrade, or if the police miraculously appear out of nowhere, I suppose we are in a state of cheerful anarchy. And so you've elected yourself sheriff. Well, I still don't see any reason why I should cooperate. Well, I'll give you two reasons. The first, moral, to make sure that justice is served. The second, recreational, so we don't get bored while we're stranded here. OK, Sheriff. I was in Istanbul on business. What is your business, Mr. Abatnot? Well, I'm the founder and CEO of Digisaurus. Ah, Digisaurus, the software company. Didn't you just send up your own communication satellite? Yeah, it's been up for over a year. There's no place in the world I can't dial up from. Do you use a handheld computer? Well, sure I do. I'm a gadget guy. Are you missing a stylus? Yeah, I am. Why? A stylus was found in the murdered man's compartment last night. Well, guess you got me then. <laughs> the crime, we have reason to believe, took place at a quarter past one. Where were you at that time? I was hanging out in Foscarelli's compartment. Mr. McQueen was there, as was Miss Debenham. Excuse me. Well, she seemed... Reserved. Cool. Did you detect in your brief acquaintance with her any hidden reserves of passion? Hidden reserves of passion? The dead man was stabbed a multitude of times. Strength was required. And ferocity. I wondered if beneath Miss Debenham's contains... Wait a second, wait a second. It's one thing to sit around speculating in your little parlor game. But when you start dragging innocent people into this... How do you know she's innocent? Well, for one thing, she has an alibi. 
She was with me when you say the crime occurred. And for another thing, she wouldn't just kill someone in cold blood. So why don't you just quit this little pseudo-investigation of yours before you destroy somebody's life? One last question. No, you've had your last question. Goodbye. He did it. What makes you so sure, my friend? Well, he has the temper. He has the required strength. And he admits to losing his stylus. Now, don't forget, he also has an alibi. Or at least he does if Miss Debenham, Mr. Foscarelli, and Mr. McQueen confirmed that he was with them at the time of the murder. Arbuthnot. The name's familiar. Who do you want to see next? There's the Italian, the young German. Uh, would you excuse me for a moment? Mr. Abathnot. Didn't you hear what I just said? I'm not going to participate in your little interrogation fantasy. Yes, you made yourself very clear. So, what do you want? I was wondering if I could borrow your laptop. Why? To use in my investigation. Well, use your own. I'm afraid I don't possess one. And that's supposed to be my fault? Oh. Knock yourself out. Just do me a favor, okay? Don't drop it. Thank you. I thought you despised computers. I do. They are a poor substitute for the little gray cells, but sometimes they are surprisingly useful. Of course. How could I have forgotten? Steve Armstrong and Arbuthnot were roommates in college together where they created Cheetah, the famous operating system. They remained friends after that, even when their careers diverged. Arbuthnot founded Digisaurus and Steve Armstrong created Whizbang. A very well-known man. Steve Armstrong was a genius at designing and marketing software. At one time, Whizbang was so powerful, it was considered a threat to Microsoft. He and his wife were a brilliant couple. The billionaire software tycoon and Sonia Armstrong, the most desirable socialite in New York. She was the daughter of an actress and a real estate developer. And her own daughter, little Daisy. Even more beautiful. And this beautiful child, how did she die? Kidnapped. And when the ransom was paid, she was murdered. But she was not the only victim. At the time, her mother was pregnant, and she gave birth prematurely, and the baby died. So did she. And her heartbroken husband shot himself. What a far-reaching tragedy. But there was someone else. A nursemaid. Mm, a French nursemaid. You see, Book, the police were desperate to arrest someone, and they believed she had knowledge of the crime. No one listened to her hysterical denials. A week before she was due to go on trial, she managed to hang herself in her jail cell. Later on, of course, it was proved she was completely innocent. Eventually, the real criminal was caught. But with his sudden new wealth, he was able to hire the best defense lawyers in America. They got him off on a technicality. He left the country, came to Europe, and was never seen again. His name was Cassetti. The American press nicknamed him the Rattler because of a, a tattoo on his chest. But what does this notorious crime have to do with our murder? I don't know. Perhaps nothing. Come with me. Let's examine Mr. Ratchet's eyes. Hmm. Just as I suspected. There is scarring on both corneas, very symmetrical. Traces of laser surgery to correct nearsightedness. But this man Cassetti had a tattoo of a snake on his chest. Mr. Ratchet has no such tattoo. But he has a scar in the same place. 
Such a scar as you might find when a tattoo has been surgically removed. This is not Samuel Ratchet. This is the murderer, Cassetti. This, my friend, is the very face of evil. Ratchet was Cassetti? Yes, but of course you knew that. What are you talking about? Are you saying, Mr. McQueen, that in all the time you worked for Mr. Ratchet, you never once suspected... No, I never suspected anything of the sort. I mean, I knew he was a bad guy, but not that bad. You followed the Armstrong case? Of course I followed it. The whole country followed it. It was the biggest case since OJ. I can't believe this. You feel strongly about this crime. Who wouldn't? Cassetti just waltzed off like that? Some stupid technicality, and he was a free man. Meanwhile, poor Sonia's left... Sonia? Oh, you mean Mrs. Armstrong? Did you know her well? Uh, yeah. No, 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 not well. Um... Uh, she was on the museum board when I was working there. Uh, we were trying to raise some money for this Etruscan funerary exhibit. She, uh, had some ideas of people to approach. Of course, she ended up practically funding the whole thing herself. She was great, you know. She was funny and beautiful and... They were so proud of that little girl. I can't believe I ended up working for this guy who killed her. Did you find out? Oh, the videotape was the first hint. Videotape? You mean... No, no, but I thought that it... I understand you were uh, among a group of people in Mr. Foscarelli's compartment last night. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, <clears throat> we were up late drinking scotch. <laughs> arguing about whether or not American culture had corrupted the world. <laughs> and what time did this gathering come to an end? Uh, about 2.30. Did you leave the compartment at any time before that? Yeah, well, sometime in there, I, I got up to go to my own compartment and use the facilities. About what time? This is very important. Well, I don't know exactly. Um, I guess it was a little after 1. Uh, the train had already stopped. Did you see anybody in the corridor at that time? I don't think so. Did you see Pierre Michel in his station at the end of the corridor? I'm um, not sure. Uh, but, you know, come to think of it, there was this other conductor guy who passed me in the corridor. Um, he was kind of short, balding, small beady eyes. Beady eyes? Yeah. Look, just for the record, I didn't kill him. Maybe I wish I had, though. this mysterious BDI conductor he speaks of. There's no one on the train who looks like that. I don't know, but we can safely assume he's missing a button on his jacket. Mr. Foscarelli! Please! This is no responsibility of yours. Hey, nevertheless, I'm delighted to help out. You are very kind. May I present Monsieur Hercule Poirot? I know Monsieur Poirot, of course. The whole world knows Monsieur Poirot. I saw your interview on television, the one where you explained how you solved the killing of Roger Ackroy. Brilliant. Thank you. I've always wanted to ask you about that first case of yours. How did you know Mrs. Ingle thought I did strychnine poisoning when the DNA and all the lab reports... Mr. Foscarelli, it is I who would like to ask you a few questions. Well, you ask me a few questions. <laughs> of course. <laughs> ask me a hundred questions. I'm honored to answer. Very well. Did you see anyone in the corridor in the carriage late last night, after midnight? S specifically, a short man wearing a conductor's uniform with a beady eye? No. I am sorry to disappoint such a famous detective, but I saw no one such as that. I saw no one at all last night. I was in my chamber having a very stimulating argument with Miss Debenet. What are you talking about? American culture. She says it is shallow, corrupting. I respond to her. How can you diss 
He's the word, yes, this. How can you diss a country that gave us Ron Pope? Ron Pope? The inventor of the Vegematic. The pocket fisherman. Anyway, he's a giant of culture. And you, Mr. Foscarelli, what is your profession? I'm in sales. That is my product, the Abliminator. Fifteen minutes a day for two months, and you, Mr. Poirot, could have a stomach like Brad Pitt in Fight Club. <laughs> Are you aware of the Armstrong family kidnapping case? Yes, of course. Very tragic. I was in America at the time. The corporate sales it hit in Disney World when it happened. Did you know any of the members of the family? Me, no. I'm not in such a league. I watched some television like everybody else. Unfortunate people. They were both in good shape, though. Mm. They knew how to take care of themselves. Thank you very much. That's all. You may ask me more questions. Just ask. It would be my honor. What is the trouble, Mrs. Hubbard? Uh, you're so horrible. Pierre, please, fetch this poor woman some cognac. Oh, yes, monsieur. What is distressing you, Mrs. Hubbard? It's the sight of blood. I've never been able to stand it. I remember when I was a little girl and the doctor decided he blood? had... Blood? Where did you see blood? In my toiletries bag. I'd reached in there to get my moisturizer and I felt something strange. And when I pulled it out, it was... What about fingerprints? Oh, there's no need to be careful, Book. I'm certain the only fingerprints that we found here are those of Mrs. Hubbard. The size and shape of the blade makes me suspect that this could be responsible for the wounds on Mr. Ratchet. Where was your toiletries bag, Mrs. Hubbard? In my closet. I'll tell you one thing, I will not stay in that room one more night. That door was locked. But then locked doors don't seem to mean much on this train. So the killer could just slip the murder weapon into my toiletries bag with my moisturizer. And then he could mysteriously disappear and I'm left an emotional wreck. Is there any more of this? Madame, you've been through a terrible shock, Mrs. Hubbard. Perhaps you should go back to your compartment and rest. Perhaps I should. It's about time someone showed me some consideration for what I've gone through. You're a valiant woman, Mrs. Hubbard. Thank you. May I ask you one more favor? Perhaps. I would very much like to conduct a search of all the passengers' luggage. May we start with yours? Why mine? To save you from any further unpleasant discoveries. Oh, I see your point. Would you please get this train moving? We're doing everything we can, Mrs. Hubbard. I hope so. You have no idea how dissatisfied a customer I can be. I can be your worst nightmare. Senor Poirot, I understand you wish to see me. Senor Alvarado, I am devastated to have to disturb you. Please, please, don't apologize. A crime has been committed, and the criminal must be discovered and dealt with. I learned from my husband one cannot let such matters linger. Yes, I recall your husband was known for his swift and certain justice. He was not a dictator, you know. But he was a patriot who understood that a country such as ours needed a strong hand. And he was right. Ever since his assassination, the place is in chaos, with all those pathetic rebel leaders calling each other El Tigre and El Comandante so-and-so, and killing each other, left and right. <laughs> I'm... Sorry to hear of your country's misfortunes. Thank you. I am glad to see you are a man of sensitivity and refinement. Oh, this is outrageous. Please, please do something, Philippe. You won't find anything, you know. I'm sure I won't, monsieur. It's fragile. Don't worry, madame. I'm tired right. of this train. Shall we get some fresh air? I am too. Let's go. Well, perhaps we could start with... Um, what is your uh, current city of residence? Paris, during the season, and New York. And what was the reason for you being in Istanbul? Carpets. I am furnishing a small house on the Amalfi Coast, and I'm in desperate need of floor coverings. Do you know anything about Turkish carpets, Signor Poirot? I don't consider myself an authority. <laughs> One 
one could study a lifetime and not be an authority. The patterns, the dyes, the threads. And are you traveling all the way home on the Orient Express? Only as far as Venice. Then I am to travel to Milan for my good friend Donatella Versace's spring collection. <sighs> but with this delay, looks like I will miss it. So many of my good friends will be there, not just Donatella, but Elton John as well, who is flying in from London just to see me. And Yevgeny Dragomirov. The Russian ballet dancer. Yes, oh, Yevgeny is my very good friend. Oh, we both know what it's like to live in exile. Signora Alvarado, could you, if you would be so kind, give me a a brief account of your movements last night from dinner onwards. I moved not at all. I went straight to bed and stayed in my compartment. F forgive my indelicacy, but um, is there anyone who can um, confirm this fact? Uh, you want to know if I have an alibi to convince you that I was not the killer? No. Oh, I, I would never... Wait a minute. There was somebody. Now I remember. I wake up in the middle of the night. My throat was dry. I rang the bell in my room to ask the conductor for a bottle of mineral water. What time was this? Oh, around 1.20. And the conductor answered the bell? Yes, but he never brought me the water. He just walked right by. I had to drink ordinary water from the tap. And what did this man look like? I recall him as a small and dark-haired. Indeed. Are you investigating everyone's luggage or just mine? Everyone's. Even the luggage of the world-renowned crime solver? Senor Alvarado, you say that you sometimes live in New York? Yes. Uh, did you ever make the acquaintance of a family named Armstrong? A family to whom a momentous tragedy occurred. Why you ask me that? Is there a reason why I should not? Senor Poirot, you are speaking of very dear friends of mine. You knew Steve Armstrong? Him only a little. But his wife, Sonia, was my goddaughter. Sonia's mother, Linda Arden, oh, she was a gifted stage actress. You must have heard of her. Oh, she was a dear friend of mine. This Linda Arden, is she dead? No, but her health is very delicate. She lives in complete retirement. Sonia is the only daughter? I believe there was another daughter, much younger. Her name was uh, Helen or Helena, or something like that. I believe she lived in England. But you have not answered my questions, Signor Poirot. What do the poor Armstrongs have to do with anything that happened on this train? Uh, Signor, the man who was murdered on the train last night was also responsible for the kidnapping and murder of Daisy Armstrong. Madre dear, I can't believe it. Is it true? Yes, it's true. Oh. Well, I'm glad somebody killed him. I'm only sorry for one thing. What is that one thing? That it was not me who did it. What could be more evident? She knew the Armstrongs. She was Sonia's godmother. She's the widow of a despot famous for killing his enemies. She killed Ratchet. Uh, but she has the wrong initials, Nina Alvarado, N or A, not H. So it could not have been she dropping the handkerchief. Nor she who dealt the killing blow. She's an elderly lady. She has more strength in her will than in her arm. Philip and Helena von Strauss. They seem to have some connection with Monegasque royalty. There's a grease spot at the beginning of her name. Okay, what is the significance of a spot of grease? Oh, probably nothing. I, I just can't help observing such things. <laughs> Come with me, book.
Just thought you might <gasps> know. You may go through Mr. Poirot's luggage. But I won't allow you or anyone else to rummage through my personal belongings. This has all gone quite far enough. Please. We all must go up on it. Must we? Why? Because Monsieur Poirot requested and he is in charge of the case. Herr von Strauss. Herr von Strauss, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Hercule Poirot. Yeah, I know. Uh, I'm glad to see your wife is feeling better. Yeah, she's almost back to her old self. Elena is very young. The horrible murder on the train last night greatly affected her. I don't want her to be further upset by your questions. But as for me, I'm happy to help you in any way possible. Very well. Uh, what were you and your wife doing in Turkey? Sightseeing, of course. Elena and I travel a great deal. Adventure travel. We live in Monaco, which, as you know, is a very small country in which one can become easily bored. Next month, we're going rafting in Borneo, and in spring, we begin training for an Everest expedition. That's very impressive. Have you, by any chance, ever heard of the Armstrong kidnapping case? I've heard about it, yeah. The man who was killed on the train last night was responsible for that very crime. Incredible. I would very much like to know the activities of you and your wife last night. Activities? There were none. We went to bed early and slept through the night. What was it that upset your wife so much after dinner? Who knows? Women can be inexplicably frail. That's true enough. But one doesn't expect such frailty from someone who is planning to climb to the top of Mount Everest. Perhaps it was merely the excitement of travel. But you said she travels a great deal. As I said, you really don't need to talk to her. I've told you everything. Though it's merely a formality. Please. Madame von Strauss, you are French, I understand. Yes. You speak English? Well, of course I do. <laughs> you heard of the terrible tragedy on the train last night? Yes, it was... Shocking. Off. You saw or heard nothing? Oh, no, I was asleep in my compartment uh, all night with, with my husband. May I ask you, do you know anything of the Armstrong kidnapping case? Yes, I, th I think it was a uh, famous crime in America, no? I think the whole, the whole family was destroyed by it. It was indeed. Excuse me. What did you want? In whose compartment did you find this, Pierre? <clears throat> in, um, in Monsieur Poirot's. The case is solved. The mysterious conductor whose jacket was missing a button, whom Signora Alvarado and Mr. McQueen saw after he murdered Ratchet in cold blood? It was I. Someone is playing with my mind, with my little gray cells. You wanted to see me, Mr. Porro? Ah, yes, indeed, Miss Devon. I've been looking forward to the pleasure of interviewing you all day. Please, sit down. Let us begin, mademoiselle, with what brought you to Istanbul. I work for a relief organization that's concerned with the welfare of children in Baghdad. The sanctions, as you may know, have made life difficult there. I was traveling back to London on vacation. The Orient Express is an expensive way for a young relief worker to travel. You disapprove? Not at all. I saved the money myself over the course of two hard years in Baghdad. It's luxury, of course, but I have a fear of flying. Such a shame that the experience was ruined by the crime last night. 
No doubt you are in much distress. No, I'm not distressed, Mr. Poirot. To judge by the gossip I've heard today, the world is a rather better place without this Mr. Ratchet in it. I congratulate you on your practical attitude to the emotional subject of murder. <laughs> I have feelings, Mr. Poirot. Pardon me if I do not find it necessary to demonstrate them for your convenience. You are contemptuous of me. Not at all. Have you ever lived in the United States? No. Visited there? No, I never cared to. I find it to be a coarse and shallow place. Oh. <laughs> but no doubt you've heard of the Armstrong kidnapping affair. What did you think of that? It was abominable, of course. Was it? Did I throw myself weeping onto the floor about it? I feel sorry for the Armstrongs, of course, but I didn't know them. Dreadful things happen every day. One can't grieve for every single unfortunate occurrence in the world. Did you see anyone in the corridor last night after midnight? I don't recall. Perhaps a small man with dark hair, wearing a conductor's uniform? No. Are we quite through? Are you in a hurry? I just don't like my time to be wasted. If there's something that you need to ask, why don't you? Why don't you just ask, for instance, did I kill Mr. Ratchet? Did you kill Mr. Ratchet? No. But you obviously think I did. So perhaps I should contact my attorney at the first possible opportunity. Very well, Miss Debenham. We will no longer practice the mincing of words. We will be direct. How well do you know Mr. Arbuthnot? Not well at all. I think you are lying. I think you know Mr. Arbuthnot quite well indeed. What did you mean when you said to him in Istanbul, I don't want to talk about it now, when it is all over? Put it all behind us. Do you think I meant murder? Did you? Have you noticed you have lost a handkerchief? One with the letter H embroidered on it? Cannot have escaped your powers of detection, Mr. Poirot, that neither Mary nor Debenham begin with an H. Yes, but your middle name, Hermione, does. Tell me, what were you and Mr. Arbath not doing in Mr. Ratchet's compartment when he happened to drop his stylus and you happened to drop your handkerchief? It is not my handkerchief. I ask you again, what is it that needs to be all over, that needs to be put behind you? What? I have nothing more to say. It doesn't matter, Miss Debenham. I will find out the truth. You were very angry with her. Anger? No, I feel no anger, Book. It is merely that the break through a hard surface sometimes requires a strong blow. So you believe that she's the murderer? That she and Arbatha conspired to murder Wretched? No, that's too easy. Remember, they both have alibis for the night of the crime. They were in the compartment with Mr. Foscarelli. But somewhere behind this business, I am convinced there is a cool and resourceful brain, and Miss Debenham answers to that description. It is vexing. Extremely vexing. Everybody on the train has an alibi, except for Signora Alvarado. These treacherous blows are obviously not the work of such a refined lady. However, she is connected to Ratchet's victims, as is young Mr. McQueen, who slightly knew Mrs. Armstrong as well. I find that to be a great coincidence. And of course, we have the mysterious conductor who left behind his button. <coughs> Excuse me, Monsieur Book. Yes, Pierre. The debris is almost cleared. We shall be underway in only a few minutes more. Excellent, Pierre. Well, that's a relief. We'll be in Belgrade before morning.
I speak to your wife? Eleanor is asleep at the moment, perhaps later. I don't want to speak to Eleanor, Herr von Strauss. I want to speak to Helena. I want to speak to her about her sister, the late Mrs. Sonia Armstrong. It's okay, Philip. Let him in. So you're right, Mr. Poirot. I am Sonia's sister. How did you guess? Senor Alvarado mentioned that Mrs. Armstrong had a younger sister named Helen or Helena. I noticed a grease spot covering the letter H of your name in your passport. It wasn't until now that I recognized its significance. Why did you alter the passport? Oh, I never touched it. She didn't do that. I did. We heard there was a handkerchief found in Ratchet's room with an H on it. Yes. I have it here. It's not mine. I... It's not? Oh, no, I... That's why I changed the passport. Even though it's not Helena's, we thought if you saw the age, you would jump to conclusions and decide she was the killer. I've never jumped to a conclusion in my life, Herr von Strauss. Surely you can understand the way we felt, Mr. Poirot. The man who died last night, this... this... Cassetti was... was the man who murdered my little niece, caused the death of my sister, my, my brother-in-law. All the people who made up my home, my family, would just take it away from me. So, of course, you'd suspect me of killing him. You didn't? No, I did not. I never touched him. Let's try, I swear it. All right. I believe you. Thank you. One thing, mademoiselle. As part of the Armstrong family, who were the other members of the household? All the usual, a cook, a gardener. Um, Steve had a personal trainer. He was really into fitness. Was there a tutor? Someone to supervise little Daisy? Yeah. There, there was this big red-haired woman. Scottish, I think, no? Young or old? Oh, old, very old. Well, at least it seemed that way to me. Her name? Miss Lassiter. Miss Lassiter? Yes. Thank you for your candor, Madame von Strauss. Sure, any time. Hey, Poirot! How dare you speak to Mary that way? Accusing her of murder? I'll tell you one thing, Poirot. You may not have any authority on this train, but you got a hell of a lot of nerve. Monsieur, control your emotions. Gentlemen, gentlemen, there's no cause for violence, please. Yeah, there is no cause for this guy wandering around making wild accusations. I will not put up with you ruining Mary's good name. You got a crime on your hands? Fine. Good for you. Either solve it or shut up about it, because I, for one, I'm tired of your little game. Very well, monsieur. I will solve this case. Book, be so kind as to ask all the passengers to gather in the bar car. Excuse me, very sorry. Sorry, eh? Excuse me. Samuel Ratchet, a man whose death seemingly fills no one with remorse, but whose murder last night on the train inspires the greatest puzzlement. Who killed this disagreeable man? I will propose to you a plausible solution to the crime. We may presume that Samuel Ratchet was a man of many dark secrets and of many enemies. Not long ago, as Mr. McQueen attested, one of these enemies makes threatening phone calls. Why do I have to be a very dead man, Ratchet? Who is this? Just thought you'd like to know. You're threatening me? Later, he dons the jacket of a conductor and equips himself with the pass key to the sleeping car. Where does he acquire these objects? We do not know. Perhaps it is not important. Suffice it to say that such things are available to a criminal with sufficient cleverness and determination. And when the moment is right, he strikes. Ratchet wakes. He attempts to fight off his assailant. In the struggle, his watch face is damaged, and some of the blows strike in a shallow manner, and Ratchet soon lies dead. But now, the murderer finds himself trapped. 
What to do? Should he escape through the window? No, the train is moving much too fast. Not wanting to risk being discovered in the murdered man's compartment, he enters the compartment of Mrs. Hubbard next door until he can find an opportunity to escape. An opportunity that presents itself when the train stops suddenly and the assassin hears the footsteps of Pierre, but in his haste, he loses a button and wakes Mrs. Hubbard. Urgently, he makes his escape, but not before encountering our eyewitness, Mr. McQueen and Senora Alvarado. Where did the assailant go? Did he leave the train? Did he stay on? These are questions we are at present unable to answer, but the sequence of events is plausible. And in a crime such as this, there are always untidy endings. Amazing. Excellent work, Mr. Poirot. Listen, I'm uh, sorry I got so hot back there. Not at all. Look, I, I think I speak for all of us when I say that, well, we're just in awe of your abilities. Incredible. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Abatnot, there is one other scenario. Perhaps not as believable at first glance, perhaps too fanciful to be accepted. Would you like to hear it? Well, uh, sure. I guess. Good. Please, resume your seat. This new scenario rests on the assumption that everything I have just said was a lie. That this phantom conductor never really existed at all. That he was created solely to provide a reasonable solution to the crime. But what other solution makes as much sense? I will now tell you, my friend, and you and the others will judge. As I said, certain questions have yet to be answered, but I am struck by the fact that several passengers on this train seemingly had close relationships with the Armstrong family. Not just Mr. Arbuthnot, who was Mr. Armstrong's college friend and business partner. Not just Mr. McQueen, who knew the late Mrs. Armstrong and thought highly of her. Not just Helena von Strauss, who was the sister of the late Mrs. Armstrong, but also Signora Alvarado, who was her godmother. Signora, perhaps now would be a convenient time for me to return to you your handkerchief. But her name doesn't begin with an H. Seemingly, you are right, my friend. But Signora Alvarado's lovely first name is Nina. If she were given this handkerchief by a devoted Russian friend, say the famous dancer Yevgeny Dragomirov, he might, for sentimental reasons, render the N of her name in the Cyrillic alphabet, which, as we all know, is identical to our letter H. Signora? The handkerchief was, of course, a clue, deliberately designed to cast suspicion on Signora Alvarado, the least likely of all the passengers to inflict a killing blow. Likewise, the stylus of Mr. Arbuthnot's handheld computer invited us to suspect a man whose alibi was confirmed by three other passengers on the train. Let us now turn to the threatening phone calls mentioned by Mr. McQueen. They suggest that someone indeed was stalking Ratchet, and Mr. McQueen's testimony in this regard will prove very useful in persuading the police of the existence of this non-existent conductor. But why would one give one's victim advance warning of such an act? Why not pounce upon him as the lion pounces on the gazelle? On the other hand, there is another sort of threat that makes profound sense. A threat that alerts the victim as to why he will die. That announces to him that justice will prevail. I propose to you that the phone calls were simply a ruse, but that the videotape describing the abduction and the death of Daisy Armstrong was sent to Mr. Ratchet in deadly earnest. When I first said 
I had seen the contents of the tape to Mr. McQueen, his response was this unfinished sentence. But I thought that... May I finish the sentence for you, Mr. McQueen? But I thought that it had been destroyed. This videotape was meant for Ratchet's eyes only, always. And it was to be discarded. But in the event, Mr. Ratchet unexpectedly completed the task himself, breaking the tape into pieces and sending it to the trash. But in the mind of Mr. McQueen, this videotape had been safely disposed of. <clears throat> Miss Debenham, why did you say you had never been to the United States? Because I never had. Oh, but I think you have. And for so long a duration as to have acquired an unconscious familiarity with American English. <clears throat> why else would you say, I am on vacation, instead of, I am on holiday? Why else use the word attorney instead of solicitor? And why, Miss Debenham, are you so determined to hide the fact that you were little Daisy Armstrong's tutor? That's a lie. Is it? That's not the impression I received from Madame von Strauss. Oh, no, I only said our tutor was an old red-haired woman. Strikingly opposite from the young, dark-haired Miss Debenham. And the name Lassiter. How interesting. Lassiter and Debenham. A well-known American department store. Your brain was searching for a name to stand in for Debenham, and naturally Lassiter is what occurred to you. So what, Mr. Poirot? What does any of this prove? Yes, you are right, Miss Debenham, in your coldly logical way. None of these details prove anything by themselves. They are small pieces of tile in a mosaic. Strands of thread in a beautiful Turkish rug. Now I will reveal to you the design. I recall my excellent friend Book telling me... I've secured you a first-class compartment. It was reserved in the name of uh, Mr. Harris, but he cancelled at the last moment. So instead of getting an unsuspecting businessman, they got a world-famous detective. Here's your compartment, monsieur. When I was given his compartment, the entire ingenious plan had to be All rearranged for my benefit. It's excellent. And what was that plan? Oh, what a pass. Just get your melatonin. Find you to be intolerable. It fell to young Mr. McQueen to make sure that the victim was suitably compliant. I think he's Belgian. What? Poirot, he's not from France, he's from Belgium. Here's your film. How the hell they call themselves a country? Since much trouble had been undertaken to arrange an alibi for the conspirators at 115. It was to the benefit of the plan for me to believe that Mr. Ratchet, at 12.10, was not dead, but alive and conscious. Bien, monsieur. Je n'ai rien. Uh, je me suis trompé. Très bien, monsieur. Unfortunately, Mr. McQueen failed to remember in this instance that his employer spoke no languages other than English. There were mistakes, assuredly, for they had to hatch their new plan quickly. But the conspirators had waited for this chance for a long time. They have worked up their courage and hardened their hearts. Armstrong's best friend. The man he had grown up with and grown rich and powerful with. The young man who had fallen under the spell, as so many had, of Armstrong's beautiful and kind-hearted wife. Sonia Armstrong's sister, whose world Ratchet had snatched away. <gasps> 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 
Sonia's godmother, the believer in swift and certain justice. Steve Armstrong's personal trainer made his clients strong, but not strong enough to survive the cruel ordeal that Ratchet inflicted upon his family. The young tutor, who loved young Daisy Armstrong with a maternal warmth that belied her cool English demeanor. The indispensable man, who cooperated gladly because the young French maid in the Armstrong household, who killed herself in the face of false accusations, was his daughter. And finally, the consummate actress, Linda Arden, a woman so skilled she could almost mask her own shattered life, the mother of Sonia Armstrong. But there was still housekeeping to do. It was convenient, as I have pointed out, to make me believe that the crime took place at 1.15. No doubt the original plan called for the murder to be discovered after the train had arrived in Belgrade, where it could be assumed that the murderer had got off. But the sudden interruption of our journey eliminated that option. And so an alternate escape venue was hastily improvised. Another of the fantasy clues that distinguishes this case. It's unusual even in my line of work, to encounter so many murderers in one room. Well, I suppose we'd better get our things together. We'll be in Belgrade soon, and Mr. Poirot will be explaining these matters to the police. Yes, you are right, Miss Debenham. But... I don't know which story to tell them. The sequence of events I've laid before you seem to me so unlikely as to be... unbelievable. What do you think, Book? Which would you believe? That Ratchet's death was the work of an international conspiracy of software designers, refined ladies, and fitness instructors? Or the work of a single mysterious assassin? I think that justice has already been served, my friend. I think so, too. No, Mr. Arbuthnot and I thought we'd fly home together. We feel a change of scene is warranted. Mr. Poirot, when I first met you, I thought you to be an inconsequential man. I'd like you to know that I've reversed that opinion. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Goodbye. Well, there will be a hearing, of course, but. Uh... The mysterious assassin theory sounds reasonable to them. Oh, it is eminently reasonable. It suffers only from the defect that it is not factual. What are you doing here? I have always had a desire to ride the Orient Express. 
It is beautiful and exotic. The same is said about me, as you well know. Yes, I know that very well. I thought it would be a fatal error in judgment to live one's life without experiencing it. As it happens, a compartment has just become available next to mine. With a connecting door. Tony Foscarelli was recently named by Wall Street as the king of infomercials. His latest product is a device that is said to reduce cellulite by the delivery of a mild electrical shock. Pierre Michel is still happily employed by the Orient Express. William McQueen is curator of antiquities at the Arbuthnot wing of the Seattle Museum of Art. Philippe and Helena von Strauss almost successfully climbed Mount Everest. Philippe, unfortunately, lost two toes to frostbite in the attempt. Signora Alvarado is the honorary chairperson of Fashion vs. Famine, a charitable organization that aids hungry children through the sale of couture clothing. My friend Wolfgang Buch took early retirement from the Orient Express and opened up a detective agency in Istanbul. Mary Debenham and Bob Arbuthnot were married in a discreet ceremony in Seattle. Caroline Hubbard is currently appearing in a Salt Lake City dinner theater production of Agatha Christie's The Mousetrap. As for Vera Rosakoff and myself, well, discretion commands that I be silent for the moment. But perhaps in due course, our further adventures will present themselves for your attention. <laughs>